Peter, we've all heard of bonking, you know, that kind of failure as we're going through a exercise bout or endurance bout. How do carbohydrates contribute to this? Well, um, I think to answer this question, we should probably spend a second understanding exactly what happens when one quote-unquote bonks or hits the wall, depending on which side of the ocean you're from, you'll refer to those two things differently. Um, as you point out, this is something that comes on very quickly, um, and there's no mistaking it when it happens, and sadly, it's very difficult to rescue from it. Um, so here's what's happening. Remember earlier we discussed the role of glucose in the brain and how the brain was so entirely dependent on glucose that uh, unless you're in this very unique state of keto adaptation, you're, you're kind of involved in that. So when you are exercising for a prolonged period of time and you run out of glycogen, which is the storage form of glucose, in the liver, there's a nuance to this which I won't get into, but basically the muscle can have glycogen in it, but it can't get it out to the brain. So the liver doesn't have enough to export for the brain, and you aren't able to take enough in, all of a sudden, your brain says, wait a minute, I don't have enough glucose, this is all I'm used to consuming, and it starts to shut the body down. It starts to say, stop whatever you're doing right now, because that's my priority right now is myself. And again, like I said, none of us have not experienced that. Okay, how do carbohydrates contribute to that? Well, that's the real irony of this. In that state of bonking, it's not that you don't have enough energy. If you take the average lean triathlete or ocean water, you know, open water swimmer, they've probably got 100,000 calories of fat in their body that they could access, but they can't access it because insulin levels are still too high and or they can't access something called acetyl-CoA and oxaloacetate into the Krebs cycle to make enough energy for their brains. So, indirectly, carbs actually contribute to this because they force you into a state of using glycogen for the brain, not using fat to make ketone bodies for the brain, and more importantly, not using fat for all the aerobic needs, which is where you should be doing them, so that even if you're not keto adapted, you can spare glucose and glycogen for the only organ that in that case needs it, which is the brain. So what we've, in, going back to our metaphor we've talked about is the car, you've really kind of eliminated our ability when we bonk. It's like we've shut off our access to the gas tank, which is representative of the fat, and an ability to create the energy without using the stored glycogen. Is that correct? Yeah, the analogy in I like to give people is taking uh, you know, a big tanker truck, like an ExxonMobil or a Shell truck, which is literally pulling hundreds of thousands of gallons of fuel in its back, and it runs out of gas on the side of the road because it's little mini gas tanks that actually feed itself or are undone. So it's this horrible tragedy where it has to call the tow truck because it can't get the gasoline out of the back of its truck, even though it's got all that effectively what I would, you know, the fat in the analogy. It can't access that, and it's heavily reliant on these very limited small sources of glucose in the front. Sounds interesting. Thanks a lot.